When we think of Roman food, the first image that usually comes to mind is a decadent emperor, worn out from his latest orgy, stuffing himself with peeled grapes, peacock eggs and flamingo tongues. Personally, I've got nothing against a good orgy. But there are so many more interesting things to say about the way that ancient Romans ate. In one of the greatest empires the world has ever seen, food was politics and religion, business and entertainment, all rolled into one. It's a topic that's far too important to reduce to a toga party cliché. You call that wafting? Get on with it. I want to find out what ordinary Romans ate. I've chosen to zoom in on one year, 80 AD. At that time, Rome had a million inhabitants, making it the biggest city in the known world. The emperor was the battle-hardened Titus. His vast dominions now reached as far as Scotland, where I was born. 80 AD was also when one of the most famous buildings of its time and ours first opened its doors for business, the Colosseum. Gladiators have always appalled and fascinated me. Most were slaves and prisoners of war, but the public adored them. On the eve of combat, fans even came to see them eat their last meal. This is the Ludus Magnus, the gladiator's gym. It's connected to the Colosseum by a tunnel. There's even a mini arena to practice in. But for these athletes marked out for death or glory, the Ludus Magnus was much more than somewhere to hone their skills. In fact, they actually lived in the gym. They slept here, they ate their meals here. And strange as it may sound, gladiators were largely vegetarian. Now, that may simply be because their owners didn't want to waste meat on men who could end up being chopped to bits at any moment. The gladiator diet was based on barley, which they put in soups or used to make bread. Apparently, they flavoured it with honey and spices. Hmm, it's not bad, but it's a bit meagre for your last meal before fighting to the death. But what's really piqued my interest is what gladiators drank. A recent archaeological study on the remains of Thracian gladiators has concluded that they had their own energy drink. It was a curious little pick-me-up, and I simply have to try it out on someone. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any gladiators in the phone book, so we've had to make do with some boxers instead. Quante ore al giorno ti alleni? Eh, due o tre ore. Io due o tre ore al mese, se mi va bene. Ma tu usi integratori energetici? Quando capita qualche volta un po' di magnesio e potassio, o qualche prodotto di quelli nel commercio. Hanno fatto degli esperimenti sulle ossa dei gladiatori e in base a queste hanno capito che avevano degli integratori molto speciali. Avevamo in mente di fare un esperimento? Sì. Potrebbe anche fare schifo. Eh, ma se la assaggio io, la assaggio pure tu, però. Va bene, non sono un atleta, quindi potrebbe non funzionare. Allora, l'integratore dei gladiatori ha un ingrediente segreto. Ed è questo, vedi? Eh, fieno greco si chiama. Ecco. Un finocchio. Sì, è un po' simile al finocchio e si usa ancora nella cucina in indiana per fare il curry. 
e nella medicina alternativa anche per trattare problemi di, di colesterolo alto, indigestione e anche la disfunzione erettile. No, nemmeno me. Problemi di questo tipo non ne ho. Viene usato in forma di cenere, quindi lo dobbiamo bruciare. Giro. Devo dire che l'odore non, non dà fiducia. Direi che è così pronta. Alla salute. Babbo, amarissima. Ma dobbiamo berla tutta? Sì, sì, ma che tutta esperimento è se, ne, se non la beviamo fino in fondo? Eh? Ah, bene. Oh. Ok, adesso ad allenarci, vediamo se Ma fuori. sei proprio sicuro? Ah, uh, sì, proviamoci, dai. Vai, vai. Ce la fai? Sì, senti la differenza? No, niente. Nemmeno io. Neanche tu. <ride> proviamo, da andare. Ah, 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 francamente... La differenza non si no, sento affatto. Ah, Sono stanco come prima. Stanco di prima. I don't think there's any money to be made by bottling and selling this ancient Roman concoction. It certainly doesn't give you wings. Basta. Absolutely no difference whatsoever. If anything, absolutely worse after that horrible taste. Yeah. The gladiators had something else that they drank just before going into the arena. It induced a kind of euphoria that helped overcome fear. Made from fermented fruit, it was also an anaesthetic. My new friend has decided to test it out on me. Come? Adesso ho capito. In inglese si chiama coraggio olandese. Vuol dire alcol. C'è da ubriacarsi con mezzo bicchiere. Adesso comincio a sentire l'effetto. Inizio a sì, sentire sono, qualche cosa. Sì. Eh, buono, pronto buono. pronto a combattere. Sì. Vieni. Pronti? Ok. Vai. Ecco. Vai. Ti preoccupare. Vai un sentimento. Dai, dai che è la pozione dei gladiatori dentro. Dai. Uh, uh, end. Uh. <laughs> Gladiators. That is the end of the experiments, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> what gladiators drank is nearly as horrifying as what they had to do in the arena. But what about the spectators? We know they were bloodthirsty, but what did they eat? This gigantic amphitheater was built nearly 2,000 years ago, and it's a fantastic place to observe just how society worked in the imperial capital. At one point or another, pretty much all of Rome's inhabitants came here. The crowd in the Colosseum was 50 to 70,000 strong. A third of them were poor people, who sat in the highest seats, so high that it wasn't easy to see. But archaeologists made a discovery up here that shed new light on what a day out at the Colosseum was like. They unearthed a little 2,000-year-old cooking hob. And what it proved was that if you didn't have enough money for a snack in the stands, you could cook for yourself between one bout of bloodletting and the next. A bit like rustling up a meal in the stands while watching the World Cup final. The humblest plebeians, the ones stuck up here, often ate a kind of porridge called pulse. Now, it doesn't take a great chef to make it. First, you need some of this stuff. Spelt, which you then boil in water. And then to flavour it, you use whatever you've got to hand. In our case, an onion, 
some cauliflower and a few pulses. This rather tasteless dish filled the bellies of the Roman poor for centuries. Mah. As always, for people for whom meat was scarce, a stodge became a staple. Mm. Somehow, this takes me back to those times that I've eaten meat pies in rain-soaked English football stadiums. The pulse isn't up to much, but the, the spectacle is so much better. While the poor were stuck up here, knights, senators and the emperor himself had seats in the front rows where they got a close-up view of the massacre. They had tastier nibbles, too. Archaeologists have found the remains of what they ate in the Colosseum sewers. Ciao, Rossella. Ciao. Rossella Rea, the Colosseum's manager, has invited me to pick through a few 2,000-year-old leftovers. Abbiamo resti di frutti di mare, un pezzetto di orata. Orata? Orata, sì. Meraviglia delle meraviglie. Un'ostrica. Ostrica mangiata. Quindi questa Doverosamente uno... cruda, con le tracce proprio della forzatura per aprirla. So this is the ancient Roman equivalent of popcorn, hot dogs and ice cream. E questo sarebbero ossa. Queste sono, ecco, l'80% delle ossa che si ritrovano non solo nelle fogne del Colosseo, ma in generale mm. a Roma, sono ossa di maiale, seguite a ruota poi dal, dalle ossa di agnello, mm. perché il maiale era molto consumato da qualunque categoria sociale. So it seems that ancient Roman stadium snacks were much healthier than ours. But if I'd been in the Colosseum for the grand opening in 80 AD, I'm not sure that I'd have been able to keep my food down. In the first three months, 9,000 animals were slaughtered, from rhinos and tigers to elks and buffaloes. E certo che gli odori all'interno dell'anfiteatro dovevano essere nauseabondi, perché noi dobbiamo pensare che c'erano dei cadaveri, di animali e anche di persone, unito all'odore di una folla massiccia, quindi il sudore, il caldo, la promiscuità, l'eccessiva avvicinanza dei, dei, dei corpi accaldati e scalmanati, oltretutto. Il cucinato, l'odore del cucinato, che forse era la cosa meno peggio. Tutto questo si cercava di mitigarlo con aspersioni di polvere di zafferano. Saffron is one of the most expensive spices on the market today, so I doubt that FIFA would even consider spraying it over an area the size of three football pitches to clear the air. Things have changed, I suppose. Even before it was finished, the Colosseum allowed thousands of Romans to put food on the table by giving them work. It's even said that the Emperor Vespasian, who commissioned the Colosseum, refused to use a new machine for moving columns because it would have cost jobs. No wonder building this monster took a decade. Let's have a look at the diet of one of the people who worked on the Colosseum. Let's say a middle-class family man, an engineer with a wife and three kids, and a couple or three slaves. In other words, a fine, upstanding gentleman like me. Well, minus the slaves. The first thing is that you can forget all of those stories about ancient Romans stuffing themselves, having a good vomit, and then stuffing themselves all over again. Because if you did something like that, you'd get a very bad reputation very quickly. Because the Romans valued frugality, even if they didn't always live up to the ideal. Breakfast was eaten at the crack of dawn, because public life began early in ancient Rome. It was a simple affair fruit and milk or a piece of goat's cheese. 
Our engineer would have eaten lunch at the inn or even at the baths, a good place to escape the heat of the day. Archaeologists have found the remains of chicken wings and lamb chops in some Roman baths. There would also have been things like olives, figs, vegetables and beans. But the main meal of the day was dinner. Eating alone just wasn't done in ancient Rome. Even the gods were invited to dinner and offered the first few mouthfuls. And then, of course, there was family, friends, colleagues. Dinner was all about the company. Come on, everyone. Romans, much like us, divided their meal into starter, main course and dessert. Dinner was usually eaten about four or five in the afternoon, when there was still daylight, so as to save on lamp oil. You have to wonder what they did for post-dinner entertainment. But there's something missing here on this table. Something essential in every Roman meal, whether you were rich or poor. Bread. And bread is what makes the next stop on my journey really important. The imperial port of Ostia. This is what's left of Ostia, where Rome got access to the sea. In 80 AD, Ostia was one of the biggest ports in the world. Goods of all kinds were brought here from right across the empire. But there was one cargo that was much more precious than all the others, grain. The very basis of the Roman people's diet. By 80 AD, Rome imported an average of 350,000 tonnes of grain every year. That's enough to make 260 million loaves of bread. And to control this precious resource, the Roman authorities created the mensores, or grain measurers. This mosaic shows us what they did. Here, the measurer is levelling out the grain in this container while a little slave, using beads on a string, is keeping a tally of the sacks. But, of course, somebody had to keep an eye on the grain measurers. And according to the experts, this guy here, the only one wearing shoes, is a bureaucrat from a powerful government ministry, the Anana. And the Anana's main task was to make sure that the city never went without bread. The Anana not only distributed the grain, it regulated the market to make sure that speculators couldn't profiteer in times of scarcity. Because if grain ran short, riot and revolt could soon follow. Not even an emperor who had lost his marbles, and there were a few of them that did, would have risked that. Emperors even paid out of their own pocket to make sure that one particularly important group of people never went without bread. Under Titus, every month, 200,000 people received a free sack of grain, like this one. <laughs> There's about 35 kilos in here. That's enough to feed two adults for about the month. Now, we might think that giving away all this free grain was charity. But in Rome, it wasn't the poor who got it. In fact, to get your grain, you had to show a token, like a tax code or an identity card. And what that token said was that you had the status of Roman citizen. Citizenship was sought after. It gave you privileges, like the vote. No surprise, then, that this constituency had to be kept on side. But being a citizen didn't necessarily mean being rich. And in Rome, only the rich had an oven at home.
So to get their grain turned into bread, everyone else went to the bakers. I've had to get up really early to catch one of the best bakers in modern Rome, Gabriele Bonci. He's promised to show me how his ancient ancestors made their bread. Ciao, Buongiorno, come buongiorno, va? buongiorno, benissimo, prego. <laughs> vieni, vieni, vieni. Eh, dove metto il grano? Il grano? Ma che ci devi fare col grano? Fare il pane, no? Ma dentro un panificio entra la farina, non entra il grano. Ah, Gio, ok. Laugh all you want, Gabriele, but in ancient Rome, bakers were often millers too. Qui si tratta di fare un pane antico, un pane romano. Quando l'unico metodo di fermentazione esistente era proprio quella dell'uva. Ah, ok, quindi niente birra, niente... Niente lievito, lievito di birra, di... niente lievito naturale, ma si fermenta con l'uva. Prima cosa, l'uva veniva pestata semplicemente con le mani per far fermentare il succo dell'uva. Farina. Nell'antica Roma la fermentazione non veniva controllata. Era molto spontanea, molto sì. acida, aggressiva. Quindi che cosa succedeva? Il pane lo facevano liquido e lo colavano in cocci come questi. Lasciato fermentare e poi infornato con tutto il coccio. Addirittura il coccio veniva rotto sul tavolo mm. e loro mangiavano l'interno del pane. Eccolo qua. Qui l'impasto ha preso forma. E cominciamo a spezzare il pane. In 80 AD, there were about 300 bakeries in the city. And even though their prices were fixed by the authorities, like the price of grain, bakers were often well off. Facciamo dei tagli. Così. Il seme di papavero era molto usato negli antichi romani. E poi possiamo andare nel forno. John, è pronto! Eccolo qua! Bellissimo! Guarda che spettacolo! Bellissimo! Questo è il nostro pane, fatto soltanto con la fermentazione del mosto duro. La salvia. Ah, pure la salvia. Ancora un po' di fighi. E a questo punto facevano colare del miele. Judging by the breakfast he made me, Gabriele would have made a fortune in 80 AD. Fantastic. Mm. Mm. Oh. Mm. You can keep your eggs and bacon, frankly. This is the breakfast of champions. Meraviglioso. Una Energia pura. Mm. Bread wasn't just the basis of the Roman citizens' diet. It also fueled the most fearsome military machine the ancient world had ever seen, the legions. Legionaries treasured their bread, not just because it filled their bellies. For them, bread was also a symbol of Roman civilization, part of what separated them from the barbarians they fought Mind you, when they were on campaign, Roman soldiers led a pretty uncivilized life themselves. As I'm about to try an experience, starting with these extraordinarily uncomfortable hobnailed sandals. They really are torture, you know, these things. I hope I'm not expected to actually walk 15 kilometers like some legionary. Roman soldiers marched for tens of kilometers every day. They hung their kit bag on a forked pole. It weighed about 30 kilos. That's about as much as my nine-year-old son. 
And as if that wasn't enough, they also had a shield, armour and a spear, or pilum, that they threw at their enemies in the opening exchanges of a battle. And with all that, they marched for as much as six hours without stopping. I'm already bushed. Time for a snack. Put my pilum down. Oh. Let's see what a Roman legionary actually carries with him. A little frying pan. There's this pretty fearsome trenching tool. There's a gourd for water, which I've already emptied. And this has got grain in it for making soup or bread. Olive oil, pretty essential. It's in here. It's very greasy. What they call lardo in Italian. It's cured pork fat. Olives. And last but not least, a bit of cheese. Pecorino, sheep's milk. Now, that might not seem very much, but behind the simple rations that every legionary was given, there was a gigantic logistics operation. In 80 AD, Rome wasn't at war with anyone, but 150,000 men were stationed on the empire's borders. Feeding them meant sending tons of grain to places like Portugal, Ukraine, the River Danube and the Balkans, all without modern means of transport. But if you ask me, despite this huge logistical effort, the average legionary would have gladly exchanged his bread and cheese for today's Italian army rations. Cappuccino, cookies and jam for breakfast and a three-course lunch, including pasta, main course and pudding. Not bad. Oh. And to think that military service lasted 25 years. There were rewards, of course, even for a barbarian from Britain like me. Serving in the Roman army would have earned me Roman citizenship and a piece of land. But farming's a bit too much like hard work for me. I need a drink. Taxi! Feels good to get those excruciating shoes off. When their marching brought them to Rome, legionaries headed here. This area was called the Suburra. It was a seedy part of town where Romans partied. In the Emperor Titus's day, this whole area was full of taverns where people would stop by for a cup of wine or three. But the stuff the ancient Romans drank was very strange. In fact, the only thing it had in common with modern wine was the grapes. Everywhere you go here, you get a sense of another city just below the surface. This osteria, or tavern, is a perfect example. It's built on top of an ancient Roman house. Not surprisingly, its owner loves everything to do with ancient Rome. This is a great place to go boozing, 80 AD style. The ancient Romans drank a lot of wine. They even drank the stuff at breakfast. They liked to dip their bread in it, a bit like modern Italians do with biscuits and milk at breakfast time. 
But ancient Roman wine was actually very different to wine as we know it today. It went through a whole series of adulterations. So I've put together this little experiment in an effort to try and understand what the real taste of ancient Roman wine was like. For a start, it was always cut with water, hot or cold, according to taste. OK, so far, nothing too strange. We've just added a bit of water. But Roman wine was full of sediment, and so it needed to be filtered, OK? And they filtered their wine through a whole series of different things, starting with barley... ..and even celery. Seems like quite a good method, this. Now comes the moment to add the flavourings, starting with honey. Now, honey was actually quite expensive in Roman times. Mm. But for flavouring wine, it was a very popular option. There we go. Should just about do it. Give it a stir. But the real luxury ingredient in Roman wine were spices. For better off drinkers, preparing wine involved mixing it with a whole range of stuff, like saffron, wormwood, aloe, elderberry, myrrh, coriander, cinnamon, aniseed. The question is, of course, why did the Romans add all this stuff to their wine? And the answer is basically their wine wasn't very good in the first place. They weren't very good at controlling fermentation, they didn't have bottles to store the stuff in, so it was at constant risk of going bad. Very often, in fact, Roman wine was a kind of halfway house between wine and vinegar. So we're going to add a bit of vinegar just to sort of reproduce that problem. Because they had no barrels, bottles or corks, or wine cellars like this one for that matter, the Romans had a real problem. They tried all sorts of experiments and wrote treatises about how to preserve wine without its going bad. And they adopted some peculiar measures. They added all kinds of things like chalk or resin uh, or even salt water. So it's only fair, for the purposes of our experiment, that we add a bit of salt water to the wine as well. So now I think we're close, or as close as we can be, to what the real taste of Roman wine was like. Their wine had so much dregs in it that the Romans drank it from vase-like cups to make sure all the rubbish stayed down at the bottom. It's not terrible, it's just not wine as I know it. It tastes a bit like a kind of ketchup. <clears throat> now we've got to see what other people think of this Roman wine. Here we un a bicchiere di vino dell'antica Roma. There you go. Want yeah, answer. I really want to know. It doesn't taste like uh, wine tastes um, like we know it today. It's also a retro gusto di pepe. Mm. Fragolino. Mm. Fragolino. It's a little bit acid at the end. C'è la cannella. Però me gusta, sa. Sì. Basta, già la Basta. Well, at least nobody's thrown up on me. Quite an achievement, I think. I would have got in real trouble in ancient Rome for offering wine to women because they weren't allowed to drink it. In fact, some sources say that men had a so-called uh, kissing right. They had the right to kiss their wives at any time to check their breath for alcohol. My wife, as it happens, asked for exactly the same right before she married me. The Romans were very fond of wine from the slopes of Mount Vesuvius, but the eruption of 79 AD that swallowed Pompeii cut off that source. 
From then on, they imported wine from further away, from places like Greece and North Africa. They imported plenty of other things too, and some are quite surprising. Ciao Ottavio, come Ciao, stai? Tutto bene. Mi fai assaggiare un po' d'olio buono? Come no? Adesso te lo passo, vai. Questo è italianissimo. Grazie. Italy today is famous for its extra virgin. But 2,000 years ago, the Romans had to import huge quantities of olive oil. The fact is, they didn't just use it to make salad dressing. Mmm. It served as fuel in lamps, as medicine for treating wounds and burns, and they went through rivers of the stuff in the bath, where they used it to hydrate their skin and hair. The average Roman went through about two litres of olive oil a month. That's twice as much as today. Most bought it from one of Rome's 2,000 oil retailers. But the city imported much more than olive oil. Salmon from the Rhine, geese and pigs from Gaul, dried fruit from Syria, Persian peaches and Turkish honey. With all these ingredients coming from every corner of the empire, it's hardly surprising that Roman food was a kind of international cuisine. Sally Granger is an expert on Roman cooking. She's going to help me explore the unusual recipes that made the Romans love their brand of fusion cuisine. According to her, it was when they conquered Greece in 146 BC that the Romans began to develop exotic tastes. Actually, looking back on this period, they say that they were porridge-eating barbarians. Oh, really? That's the image they had of themselves, that they weren't interested in food, they didn't have cooks, and it's only with the contact with the Greek East, okay. where slave cooks initially, I think, are taken as, 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 as war captives yeah. and brought to Rome and they... ..cos they liked the food they found in Greece. So they brought them back to Rome and said, ..hey, cook like that for us here. So Rome's becoming a, a, an international city in some way. It a is. A city of immigrants. Absolutely, I think so. So what did these Greek chefs bring to Rome, then? Probably the most important thing was fish sauce. Is that it? That's it, yes. Very similar to nook nam or nam, oh, nam pla, geez. which is Thai fish sauce. It honestly smells like it was made out of go, have rotting a go. jock straps no, no. and old socks. No, it's a good smell. Oh. No. Boy, that's strong. Don't <laughs> believe you. What's it? I mean, how do they make this stuff? Well, whole small fish and salt mixed together, left to dissolve, ferment in the sun in a large tank mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean sun, two or three months. And actually, if I, if I make Roman food without it, you know the difference. There's something wrong with the food without it. Yeah. There are two types. One is a table condiment, yeah. which, which the diner would use, would pour onto his oysters, for instance, and one is a, is a cooking fish sauce. Right. The table condiment is garum. Mm. is made from blood and viscera of fish, and only those components. Even worse. The cooking sauce is laquaman. Under my uh, expert supervision, Sally is making belly of pork, lamb kebab and conchicla, a sort of frittata with lentils. Then she has me add some spices of a kind that you'd associate more with Eastern cooking than with ancient Rome. Strangely enough, cumin and coriander are the two dominant spices in Roman food. Now, this, this means, basically, that Roman food tasted of curry. Great. Which is confusing for people. Yeah. And a sweet and sour curry, because they used an awful lot of vinegar and honey as well. So we're talking quite a dense, rich sauce. Apprenticeship. OK. Sorry. Over the next four hours, Sally has me chopping, slicing, stirring... A bit harder. Come on. We need a bit more labour involved. There are stories of, of, of slaves being whipped because things weren't quite right. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, sadly. Oh, get yes, on with it. yes, yeah. <laughs> 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 
I suspect she's making me work this hard because I roped her into another one of my experiments. We put our conchi clap in the oven. This little marvel is known as an ape, a bee. Peasants use it to carry their produce. We've transformed it into a fast food stand so Sally and I can serve out what we've cooked. We're a bit apprehensive about giving out ancient Roman recipes seasoned with fish entrails. So to reassure our customers, we've added some tasteful decorations to the stand. In ancient Rome, only the richest had a kitchen at home. The best most people could hope for was a little stove to heat a few things up. So huge numbers of Romans ate in the street. Fast food is not a 20th century invention. Ready to go, Sally. Because eating out was the norm rather than the exception in ancient Rome, there were thousands of taverns, takeaways and fast food stores scattered throughout the city. Even right under the arches of the Colosseum. Taverna mobilis. Taverna mobilis. Cibo di strada degli antichi romani. Venite ad assaggiare. It's for free. Come and try. Between the lashings of fish sauce and the heavy spices, I feared the reaction of the notoriously picky modern Italian diners. But they actually liked our ancient Roman food. Phew! Mm. Sally, that was a complete triumph. You've converted half of modern Rome to the joys of ancient Roman eating. You've got to open a chain. Yes, please. Yeah, love to. To burn a mobilis all over the city. Brilliant idea. Good luck with it. Thank See you. you. Cheers. So our little Taberna Mobilis was a bit of a star attraction at the Colosseum today. 2,000 years ago, people didn't just come here for a takeaway. You could also get exotic fresh meat from the slaughtered beasts. But a lot of the meat that appeared on Roman tables was the product of ritual sacrifice. The ritual slaughter of animals was crucial to Roman religion. It marked all kinds of public occasions like religious festivals, anniversaries and military victories, but also private ones like births, marriages and deaths. And after every sacrifice, the animal was eaten, part by the gods and part by the mortals. Unfortunately, sacrifices are banned in the Colosseum these days but a nearby roof terrace provides a nice scenic alternative. The sacrificial victim was usually a pig, a calf or maybe a lamb. Now, the first thing that happened was the animal had its throat cut and then it was disemboweled on the altar. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to imagine that bit because if I showed you what happened, my kids wouldn't let me back in the house anymore. Next came the key moment. The priest examined the innards for impurities. If everything was OK, the sacrifice was considered propitious and the carcass was divided. The gods liked life-giving organs like the heart, the lungs and the liver. They ate them roasted and the priests got to join them in the meal. Everyone else got the meat. And in big public ceremonies, the meat was put on sale. That way, nothing was wasted. 
In fact, the Romans ate meat quite a lot because powerful patrons often laid on sacrifices for their hangers-on. It was all part of the great Roman art of winning friends and influencing people. Emperor Titus, who inaugurated the Colosseum, was a big believer in sacrifice. And you can hardly blame him for being superstitious given the disasters that struck early in his reign. Fire, plague and volcanic eruption in Pompeii. His bad luck was destined to continue. The year after the Colosseum opened, Titus was attending a sacrifice there when the animal escaped. A terrible omen. The crowd saw him leave the stadium in tears. He caught a fever and died a few days later. Over the centuries that followed the opening of the Colosseum, the Roman Empire broke up and a Christian Europe emerged. The sacrifices disappeared and over time, so would much of Rome's food culture. So what have I learned at the end of my exploration of Roman food? Well, it's clear that there was more on offer in the Colosseum than gladiators and wild animal fights. The Romans hated eating alone and their wine was borderline undrinkable. And I found out that not only were gladiators badly fed, but they had revolting sports drinks and went into the arena tipsy. Last but not least, Religious sacrifices were a very good opportunity for a juicy steak. Ancient Rome hasn't left many traces in Italian food today. There are exceptions. The great Mediterranean elements of olive oil, grain and wine have remained fundamental. And there's one more absolutely crucial legacy. Urban life. The city was the place that sucked in ingredients and creative energies from the countryside. Today, as in Italy's ancient past, the city is the beating heart of a great cuisine. <laughs>